great. Uh, great. So tech, first of all, thanks a lot for having me invite you to this conference. It's a great conference. I, I was there in 2016. I always remember the conference because I left the United States at night thinking that uh, we had one president. I landed in Chile in the morning and I realized that we had a different president. So I have people crying on the plane. A long time ago, but anyway, it was a great conference. We had a great time, uh, fantastic people, and, and so it's too bad that this time is, is in Zoom, but hopefully some other time. Okay, um, so just me give you some context about the paper. So Mark and Manuel, uh, which I know well, Manuel is a colleague of mine. Mark, we've seen, we've known each other for many years. Are really giants in the field of sovereign debt and default. Um, they have a, the great economists, really smart, so a lot of human capital, and there was a lot of labor. spent a lot of time thinking about these issues. They even wrote a book, uh, which I think is coming out or came out already on, on Princeton University Press, all about these issues, a great book. Uh, so I, uh, whenever they say something, whenever they write a paper on that, listen carefully, they, they have a lot of really great insights, just to put in, 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 in context what they're doing. So it's, it's, it, and it's, and the paper, it's a, not surprising, a pleasure to read. So what does the paper do? Uh, basically propose a new financial instrument for a sovereign debt borrower to subject to the full risk. And it's just a floating rate bond. As Mark explained very clearly, this is a pretty simple thing and actually something that people, government could issue. It's not a, you know, Italian government did it in a different context, but you could do it. Basically, it's a long bond and the long bond usually have a fixed coupon, but now here's the coupon is going to be indexed to interest rate on short bonds. So at times where the, the interest rate on short bonds is very high, the long bond also is going to provide a higher coupon. Uh, why did you do that? Uh, again, I might explain very clearly. This basically this combines two feature, two desirable features of long and short bonds. First is a long bond, and being a long bond is immune to rollover risk. You don't have to roll every every time. You have to, you don't have to go to the market every 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 month and reissue the whole stock of that. It's a long term. It's a long term bond, so that solves the problem, which seems to be a really big problem in that market. But also uh, it's immune to dilution risk. Uh, and why is it immune to dilution risk? Exactly because, um, you know, if you're trying to dilute the risk and, and, and issue a bunch of short of debt, the, the interest rate is going to go up and going to make this bond very expensive. And so this is going to protect it from dilution risk. Uh, so that's kind of, like, has, has this, as, as the guys say, happy medium. Uh, I think the most, in, the most beautiful part of the paper, at least for, for my, for, for my uh, thing, is, is, uh, is is to show the, um, the result that show basically that when you use this floating rate bond, you achieve exactly the same allocation as short term bonds. So you're immune to this dilution problem. So even though it's a long run, it's a long bond because of the structure of the coupon, it behaves exactly like a short bond. So it's, it's a very nice, simple proof, of like you know, clean and, and, and very, very, very intuitive. Now they take this, then they say, okay, but this is a, this is a proof for a kind of a special context. Let's put it in a, in a, in a general standard model and, and look at the, um, what are the benefits of doing that for a government? Does it matter? Uh, and the benefits are fairly large. So th this is summarized sort of the, the, uh, the, the key benefits. So this, the first one is the benefit relative to short bonds. So if you have an economy with only short bonds, then you don't have any, any dilution problem because the short bonds, so I've, I've, the incentives between the, the, the when the government issue more bonds, they realize that it's costly for them because they pay high interest rates. So the incentives are aligned. However, there is rollover crisis because you have every, every period you have to go to the market and reissue the entire bonds and there's some probability your auction fails, you're, you're out of luck and you have to consume very little. So, Basically, show that you know, depending on the endowment, initial endowment, you can have one percent of gain of GDP. Why? Because basically, you avoid rollover crisis, rollover crisis by uh, by introducing this bond. The second part is well, what what if you have standard long-term bonds? Well, you still have a very large gain, about one percent, and what you gain here, you avoid the dilution risk. Why? Because with a standard bond, the government has incentives. So there's some bonds out there. Now I'm going to issue some new uh, new short bonds. And yeah, the, the, the old bondholders are gonna be are gonna be losing value, but I, I don't care. I don't take it into account. So there is too there is too much issuing. But of course, the lender anticipate that, and so long bonds are too expensive. So it's very hard for the government to use long bonds because long, people, investors don't want to buy them because they know that tomorrow they're gonna be screwed by the by the government. So long bonds are too expensive. It's very hard for the government to borrow, and that's why there's welfare cost by introducing this. 
um, this floating rate, you kind of make, you protect long-term bonds, makes it more attractive to investors, investors are gonna buy, and so you have the bond. So it seems like a, 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 really, a really nice deal. So what I'm gonna try to do in this, in this, in this discussion uh, is just to provide, uh, just write down a simple, simple model, three-peer model. I, I like this, this simple model um, for, 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 uh, for three reasons. One is, well, it's, the simple model, I think you're gonna see even clearer the intuition with the results, even though I have to say the paper intuition is very clear, but it's, you're gonna see a little bit more. Uh, then, then the other thing is that because of this conference, this conference is really about spillover. So I actually put a little bit of a spillover risk there, you know, from the north to, to, the, to the south. And that is going to show how the, the, there's an additional role for long bonds. Basically, you know, long bonds in, uh, in, in, in Mark's paper, Mark and Manuel's paper, and uh, kind of uh, provide protection against this uh, rollover crisis. Here, I'm going to show the long bonds actually provide protection against this type of recessions, which are driven by spillover. So US interest rate in the US goes up uh, and, and you have a recession in Chile. And, and so you have a recession with high interest rate. Long bonds provide, you know, it's, it's very bad. You have to go to the market and you have this very high interest rate. If you have long bonds, you don't have to go to the market. So I'm gonna talk about that. And then finally talk about um, alternative mechanisms uh, for preventing, for preventing um, dilution. Okay, so here's the model. Uh, it's three periods, so zero, one, two. Um, Preference, standard, utility, discounting. Now there is a world interest rate, which potentially fluctuates. So just think about the, the interest rate in the US. Now endowments, and here I'm, I'm just trying to be, you know, capturing in the simplest possible way the history of an emerging, the partners in emerging market. So at time zero, the, the economy starts with some income and it's fairly low, think about low. Like, so you wanna borrow from the future. Now in period one, you enter, you, you have like a, a but possibly a recession, and a recession you have low income and high interest rate. So this is really thinking about below for north U.S. raising interest rate, you go into a recession, or you have a boom when you have a uh, high income and and low interest rate. Uh, now in the third period, uh, after you go through this, there is there is potentially a very high income, so a commodity boom, or actually the emerging markets finally become, finally emerges. So there is high this income is high, but it's uncertain. So you might, might get there, you might not get there. So here the deal is like, what, what do you wanna do? What do you wanna achieve? You wanna borrow from the future and bring income today. So that's why the, the, you know, there's borrowing here. Uh, and, and now to capture the, the tensions that are lying in this paper, I'm gonna allow two possibilities. In the first period, you either borrow long or short. If you borrow long, not, you don't have to worry about borrowing in the next period, you, you have only to repay in, this, in the period two. If you borrow short, you have to go to the market again. Now in period one, if you borrow short in the first place, you repay. And for simplicity here, I'll, I'll assume no default. So in the first period, you default. You don't default, but then you go to the market again. And in the second period, you decide to default. So in the, in the final period, you, you decide to default to repay. And you know, if you borrow long, that's why you decide to default. If you borrow short, short, you only decide to default on the, of the debt you had in the second period. Now, if you borrow long, there's a possibility of dilution. So you might, in the first period, you might have additional that, that you carry, carry on. So what happened, how do I measure? Uh, usually in these models, the fault is, is sustained by reputation. So you don't, you default because, you know, you don't default because you're a school of credit markets. In final horizon models, you say, well, if you default, you lose a fraction of your output. So, uh, so otherwise there'll be no incentive to repay. So basically the, 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 the country is gonna, in the final period, is gonna repay if what is left from default, so suppose the country defaults to get alpha minus uh, times one minus alpha, alpha is a fraction lost, that's gonna, the default payoff. If it repays, it gets the full output, but it has to repay both the long-term debt and the short-term debt. So the, the, the country's gonna default in this case, being, meaning that the country is gonna default if output is below this threshold. What's the threshold? The threshold is the total amount of debt accumulated by the country uh, divided by the default cost. So the more the debt and the, and, the, and the lower the cost, the more the fault there will be, pretty standard. Now, there is a lender, the lender is neutral, it's gonna charge its prices, it's gonna offer these prices for the debt, and the prices, of course, are gonna depend on the world interest rate, and are gonna depend on the probability of the fault. The higher probability of the fault, uh, the higher the price. Now, not, notice here the key thing in the, the dilution, probability of the fault depends both on long and short. So, 
if in P I issue the Malong that in period one the government decides to issue more short, that's gonna also increase the probability of the fault of the law. And that's the, that's the heart of the delusion. And in this simple model, you see you see very, very, very clearly. So now what's uh, uh what are uh, what are the features that are relevant in the in the simple model? Well, first, there is a role for long-term debt, as, as, as I discussed before. And the role is, is coming from these interest rate shocks, correlated with recessions. So if you try to borrow short, then you, you go into period one, and in period one, you might get in a state in which you, have, you are in a recession, and borrowing is very expensive. That's really not desirable. You know, go, 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 you know, in a recession, you have like unemployment, you want to borrow, but it's really expensive because the market is interest rates are high. In this case, that, that there is a welfare cost of going accessing the short market, long-term bonds works really, really nice because you don't, you don't have to go to the market. You may not for, for you have to still want to go, but you have to go much less and you pay less. So that's, that's a really high, nice hedging property. So. That's why it makes long-term, that even in absence of default, forget about the default completely, it just makes uh, long-term debt very, very, very desirable. But now there is a debt dilution problem also, uh, because remember the default probability depends on long and short. So once you increase, so suppose you borrow long in the first period, now you're in the second period, you might decide to you borrow some more. Well, now you're gonna increase the risk on, on, uh, on, the, um, on the, the risk on, on long-term debt. But now you don't take into account because it has already been, been already issued the first period. So there's basically an externality from government at uh, time one on government at time zero. And there's nothing you can do about it. It's not like, you know, uh, at least in, in, in the simple model. Basically, the, because market know that when, when time's gonna come, government's gonna issue these short bonds. That they don't care about the, the bonds issued in the past, they're gonna issue too much. So long-term long debt is too expensive because of the solution risk, there's underborrowing and there's welfare cost. So this model has, has, has all these things. Now, what, what are the results? And, and, and here, so these are, I, I, you know, the, this is not a quantitative model, just pick kind of random, random numbers, but it's, it's sort of interesting. This is the full cost on the x-axis. So this area here, there's no default. Basically the full costs are high enough that it's never the fault of certain equilibrium. Well, in this case, because there's never a default, you see that you prefer using long than short. So there is, there is, there is a lot of, long bonds are better and the welfare gains are higher. Or, so long bonds are better than short bonds. So basically if you give the choice of government time zero, do you want to borrow long or short? They say, I want to go long. Because long bond provides a hedge against, it, against, uh, against this recession risk that we talk about. And there's no dilution problem because there's no default. But as you make the full cost low, then you start having dilution problem. So long-term debt is not that great because it's risky, there's dilution risk and so it's very expensive. And so actually you see that here, the, the, the welfare is reversed. The government prefer to use short, short, even though, yeah, they, they have this hedging risk, but long-term bonds is so subject to dilution risk that it becomes too expensive. So in this case, in, in, we call the debt dilution zone, there is probability of the fault and actually using short-term short debt is better. So now, Final final two minutes. Okay, uh, Mark. Mark. Uh, the paper says, well, in this in this situation, floating bond, floating rates might help a little bit. Now, my question is, well, maybe, but as, and, and they're recognizing it, but they're very open about it. Once you have shocks with water interest rate, then the coupon on this long term bond would increase in bad times, even absent default, and so that will make that this bond not very because it. You pay higher coupon in bad times, but the lenders are soon, so they don't care. But the borrower care, and so you lose the hedging property. So it's not so obvious that this particular bond will help with this particular shock. It is true that this floating rate will still protect the bond from dilution. So if you have the fault risk, it helps with that, but has less hedge property. So it's not so obvious in this world. If if, if really your concern is like uh, you know um, high interest rate shock, that maybe this one. Um, not, not, would not be worth so much. So just to give you an intuition, think about mortgage payments and you say, well, let me issue a new product, which is a mortgage that uh, when your credit score goes up or goes down, you pay, you pay, more, uh, you pay more, more interest. So, well, yeah, that would protect the mortgage lender because it says, look, if my customer gets in trouble, has to pay, so my mortgage is protected, but it's not a very good hedging for, for, for the borrower. So it's not so obvious that that's going to work. 
Now, the other alter alternative is this very nice paper by Charlie and Junger, which you say, well, let's put seniority clause. How do we protect long term debt? It says, well, in case of default, first, you get paid first. Uh, I think that maybe is something that would, would still address the illusion without altering the hedging properties of long bonds. Um, my final comment is that, yes, okay, this is, this is possibly, so the type of mechanism you want depends on shocks, but in reality, even though there's a bunch of papers by Chatterjee and Junger and uh, Cesar and other people says, but oh, this debt illusion seems to be a big issue in models, we don't see a lot of instruments that deal with that illusion. Why not? And I was thinking maybe one thing, maybe we can think about it in, in the discussion, is that you know, the fault is not too sensitive to actual level of debt. Maybe countries with default, when they have to default, they have like a really bad shock and the default, whether they have low debt or high debt, they always default. In that case, you know, if, if that's the case, then whether you have more or less debt is not really important for the, for the, for, 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 for this, um, for the, where, where the fault happens. And so maybe that's why we don't see this, this, all these instruments, these creative instruments uh, to deal with the fault, to deal with the dilution. Okay, let me conclude. Uh, I think this is very nice, uh, sharp, and extraordinarily clear, and no extra word, exactly the right word. I love, I love this paper. Uh, it proposes a simple instrument to isolate long-term debt from dilution. And you know, it's easy enough that uh, government could experiment, maybe issue some of these bonds and see if they, they are attractive to, to investors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fabrizio, for your, for your comments. And now um, we have some time for questions from the audience. If you'd like, you could raise your hand uh, in Zoom and I can uh, direct then the, the questions to, to, to Mark. Yes, okay. So uh, I, I fully agree with Fabrizio. I think this is a great paper uh, and there's a lot of uh, food for thought here. So my one question is, so this, this, this last point Fabrizio made, I, I, I would like to um, have Mark uh, get to the details of that a little bit. I mean, what, how would, if the lenders are risk averse and if you guys do include risk premium shocks, as, as you said, you are actually already doing, that, that, that will not be an issue, correct? Is my intuition correct there, uh, Mark? So, yeah, so let me just say two things on the risk premium shock. So, and this relates to, to what Fabrizio was saying, is that you really would want the coupon to be indexed to the action. Right. This is kind of what this floating rate is doing is that the government is taking an action and you want them to bear the cost or the benefits. It's, you know, akin to a moral hazard kind of thing. Now, the risk premium is beyond their control. Uh, so it'd be nice if you could hedge that. And so one. So there's two ways you could go, at least the two ways I've thought of is one is that you just keep what I have and then you bear the risk premium in the coupon. The other is that you index uh, to the spread over your bonds to some index of similar, you know, as uh, Shabnam, as you've shown and, and, and as well known that all these types of bonds move together, right? So, so corporate bonds, uh, other sovereign bonds, all of the similar risk category, they all move together. And so you can think of that as indexing to the spread But then you you know there's still then uh, uh, you you lose the, the very clear implication that that um, the zero the, the dilution risk in that case because there will be capital gains and losses. Thank you, Mark. Um, any other questions from the from the audience? So, Mark, if you want to. Uh, Uh, so one thing. Second, um, so maybe dilution risk isn't a big deal. I kind of agree with that, but there's a striking fact that whenever these crises happen in Europe, in in Latin America, you see a clear pattern that the government only issues short-term bonds. So there's something in these crises that they're responding to. Uh, that says short-term bonds are the things. And I, I do agree, and it's exactly like in your simple model. When default risk is the primary threat, 
short-term bonds is kind of provides the right incentives uh, for doing that. The other thing we see in the data is, is uh, non-market mechanisms to try to handle dilution risk. So conditionality is a good example, or the uh, stability and growth pack, all these kind of non-market ways to try to, to limit uh, fiscal policy. So it does seem to be uh, an issue. And then finally, on the seniority clauses, they would be great, but, but it's already a little bit um, hard to say exactly how sovereign bonds are enforced in practice, right? There's a lot of legal and reputational issues that come into play to think about it. And then to add in how would seniority clauses be enforced, it adds another layer of complication that I think we don't really know exactly. We don't see them in the data. The models cry out for them. And obviously we see them in the corporate data uh, for, for similar reasons. Uh, uh, and so there might be some issues about legal enforcement that we're just overlooking in these models. Looks like Pierre Olivier has a question. Yeah, Pierre Olivier. Yeah, just uh, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to, I mean, I think this is super interesting. Uh, I enjoyed the presentation and discussion. I'm, I'm trying to understand um, in a world in which you have these variable coupons, what the term structure, the zero coupon term structure would look like and whether it would look very different from, from what we have right now. And a related point is it, it, it um, seems that you're shifting the, I mean, it's, it's almost as if you're saying, let's move back from local currency borrowing to foreign currency borrowing in some sense. I mean, it, it, it protects the, uh, the coupon that is paid by the, uh, the borrower uh, to the lender. I mean, and, and you, you can think of issuing debt in foreign currency and that protects the, the lender or issuing in local currency and that protects the borrower. And, and it, it sounds as if like the variable coupon is like moving from local currency to foreign currency. Do I, do I get that right or am I completely off? Uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, I think even with, with low, uh, with local currency bonds, uh, there's a call for, for, there's a dilution problem there as well to inflation, right? This was the original Italian bonds were, were kind of designed to, to do this is that, that long-term bonds are subject to dilution through inflation risk. Uh, so I don't think it's really a local versus foreign currency. I think it's really just providing the correct incentives for the government going forward to bear the cost of their decisions. I mean, that's really what this is designed is that at the margin, you want the government to be the winner or the loser based on any decisions that they make. Well, I think uh, Pierre is saying maybe, I don't know if it, but maybe if, suppose you issue a local currency that and you put a coupon in foreign currency. So whenever, whenever you, whenever you, that gives you the incentive not to depreciate it because whenever you depreciate ah, it. Yeah, so that right. would be the case. So that would be, that would be, yeah. So I was thinking of, um, uh, um, you could have in the local currency, you could, you could have a, a coupon index to the CPI, but that would be the same, right? With, yeah. With, 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 dollars. with, with uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly that. So, uh, you have the coupon index in dollars, and so the, any kind of div, any kind of inflation risk, um, uh, the the government bears it. Yeah, still a few, uh, few more minutes for questions. So I have a, I have a comment on the seniority, the difficulty on the seniority enforcement, because there is one particular instrument which is clearly senior. Uh, which is IMF lending. Uh, so maybe uh, what you have here has some bearing on the design of uh, the lending programs that the IMF is putting out so as to reduce the dilution of, of, of legacy, well, the legacy, the legacy lenders that uh, don't want the IMF to come in because then they get diluted. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, no, that's interesting with the IMF. I mean, as I, as I mentioned, the IMF usually imposes conditionality, and then we get into the situation of how to enforce this ex post, right? There's a commitment problem on the IMF side um, when the conditionality gets violated. And so, in, you know, floating rate coupon would index the, 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 the rate on future fiscal policy in a way that conditionality is supposed to do. Um, now, the problem with the IMF, it is considered senior, 
de facto. Um, but, uh, you know, it's tied up. It's not a market, really. It's not a really market relationship, right? right? So it's tied up to a lot of political economy issues. So, but it would be one way to get around conditionality. Well, one way to implement conditionality where you index the payments on the IMF loans to decisions made by the government. And then the question is, how is that enforced? It was private private lenders, there's a legal, there's a legal structure to enforce these things. Uh, and the default process for the IMF it would be a little bit, it would be the same issues as, as with the stability and growth pact or conditionality.